Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for being here on this cold, brisk winter morning. Carol, it's my pleasure to introduce our instructor um, and poet this morning. Carol Stone is a distinguished professor of English and creative writing emerita Montclair University, and she's ready to share her knowledge and some poetry and her instruction with us. Carol, I welcome you. Thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, well, as we know, uh, this workshop is called The Poetry of Witness. So I guess the first thing that it would be logical to do is to, find, uh, to define exactly what is meant by that. Now, that expression was coined by Carolyn Forche, whose book I have here. This is her very, very first book when she was a young woman. It's called The Country Between Us. And she went to El Salvador to be a witness to the dictatorship and the killings that were going on at that time. And I think that's you know, how she got to that phrase. I do want to stress, however, that the poetry of witness, although because of Forche has a political connotation for the purposes of this workshop and just in general, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be political. I know we have some uh, poets and writers among us who are very political. Uh, Virginia in particular has written about 80 poems about things that happen all over the world, which astonishes me. But I do want to add that, the, that whatever you write can also be personal. For example, uh, you might want to write a, a poem about a family member. And I'm going to read an example of that kind of poem. Or you might uh, want to write a poem in, in memory of, of, of a person. So that, or even describe and write elegies of a person's dying. I'm not trying to be morbid here. I'm just, you know, trying to give other uh, suggestions for people uh, who may not be interested in, in, in writing, for lack of a better term, what we have come to call a political poem. Another example would be a very uh, famous form, Letter to My Father, that Franz Kafka wrote, a very personal denunciatory letter about his relationship with him. So it could be letter to my father, letter to my mother, whatever family member you have emotions, strong emotions about that you would like to write a poem about. An interesting way of getting to a political poem, I think, is thinking of some events that you might want to write about. Another famous poem is Babi Yar, by Babi Yar by the Russian poet Yetrushenko. And that, that event that it was so traumatic, he was the first person, Russian poet, who wrote about that. Um, so I, I think in terms of prompts, some of the suggestions that I just made might work. But I find another, another interesting way uh, to get to a poem, depending on, again, what your interests are, is to think of, of an event. Some of them sprang into my mind, like, for example, uh, the Battle of the Somme in the World War I, which was so, which was really a slaughter of English soldiers and is so important over there, perhaps not as much in this country. And we all come from different backgrounds. So, you know, there's plenty of leeway and plenty of room to go to who you are and exactly where you are. Sometimes just the name of a city will do it. You know, the names of cities. Even the city you grew up in, for example, I have lots of poems to my exalted hometown, Newark, New Jersey. And, <laughs> You know, I've got, I've got uh, many, one is just called Elegy to Newark. So I'm just throwing these ideas out to you, but of course you have ideas of your own. Um, now uh, I mentioned uh, Forche's poem. This is, I think, one of the most devastating American poems and I urge you all to read it. Yeah, it's so nice that all of these poems are online so you won't have any difficulty finding them. 
-hmm. And we might be pressed for time. So I'm just going to read the beginning of it and then get to the devastating end, just because, as I said, we don't have enough time if we want to address your own work. It's called The Colonel. That could give you some ideas for the title of a poem. What you have heard is true. I was in his house. His wife carried a tray of coffee and sugar. His daughter filed her nails. His son went out for the night. There were daily papers, pet dogs, a pistol on the cushion behind him. There was a brief commercial in Spanish. The parrot said hello on the terrace. The colonel told her to shut up and pushed himself from the table. My friend said to me with his eyes, say nothing. The colonel returned with a sack used to bring groceries home. He spilled many human ears on the table. They were like dried peach halves. There was no other way to say this. He took one of them in his hands, shook it in our faces, dropped it into a water glass. It came alive there. I am tired of fooling around, he says. As for the rights of anyone, tell your people they can go fuck themselves. He swept the ears to the floor with his arm and held the last of his wine in the air. Something for your poetry? No, he said. Some of the ears on the floor caught his scrap of voice. Some of the ears on the floor were pressed to the ground. Mm -hmm. I never stop shivering when I read that poem. She wrote it in May 1978. So that's a, uh, that's a classical poem of, you know, not addressing politics directly, but showing the horror. Another poem, uh, I'm just, you know, illustrating this particular political aspect with some other examples that are very, very iconic and famous. And the next one, which you probably know, is Death Fugue by Paul Ceylon, which is about being in a concentration camp. But the beauty and the pity of this poem is he does not say that directly. That became his most famous poem. When he was in Paris at the end of his life, he said, I never want to hear that again. And yet it is you know, constantly read. Uh, he was born in Romania. And uh, as I said, he was in a concentration camp. And again, I think what this poem has in common with Forche's poem is he doesn't take the issue of the Holocaust on directly. In fact, the poem is almost like a lyric. It's beautiful with these astounding images. So, I think perhaps some poets just need to do that. And in Salam's case, his pain was so deep, he did commit suicide by jumping into the sin, I regret to say. Um, but he had this wonderful uh, creative life before then. So I'll read part of this because I want you to hear that this poem has a refrain. And that's what makes it both elegiac and beautiful at the same time. Death Fugue. Black milk of daybreak, we drink it at sundown, we drink it at noon, in the morning, we drink it at night, we drink it and we drink it. We dig a grave in the breezes, there one lies unconfined. A man lives in the house, he plays with the serpents, he writes, he writes, when dusk falls to Germany, your golden hair, Marguerite, he writes it and steps out of doors, and the stars are flashing. He whistles his pack out. He whistles his Jews out of the earth, then dig for a grave. He commands a strike up for the dance. Black milk of daybreak, we drink you at night. We drink in the morning at noon. We drink you at sundown. We drink and we drink you. A man lives in the house. He plays with the serpents. He writes, he writes. When dusk falls to Germany, 
your golden hair, Marguerite, your ashen hair, Shulamith. We dig a grave in the breezes. There one lies unconfined. And then there's more to the poem, but the last two lines repeats that refrain again. Your golden hair, Marguerite, your ashen hair, Shulamith. I think this is one of the greatest poems ever written and so deceptive because of its beauty and we know what is going on underneath. So I just felt that this workshop was an appropriate place to read that poem. And I'm going to read one more and I decided it might be good to read a more benign one as my last example, because these are so, so yeah. chilly. Yeah. And, um, also because it illustrates for those of you who feel as if you would rather write a more family poem or a more personal poem, you know what I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. Again, it's an iconic poem, very anthologized. It's called Those Winter Sundays, and it's by an African-American poet who was not, he was kind of in between the Harlem Renaissance and then the later poets now who are more, pros, you know, more upfront and, and, and protesting. And so the poem really doesn't use his identity as an African-American in the poem, but it's very beautiful. Those winter Sundays. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black cold. Mm -hmm. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know, what did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Now, the line in this poem, I think I even stole it and put it in a poem. You won't tell anybody, I hope. But the line is, fearing the chronic anchors of that house, because it has such universal universality. He doesn't tell us what they were, but we get it. And yet, his father got up and did that for the family. So that's, that's a good example of uh, a family poem. This gives you a lot of options in your own writing. And I also want to stress that because I am a poet, although I have written in other forms, especially academic articles when I, academic articles when I had to, so I'm not doing those anymore. But in any case, um, you will write in your own form. I know that perhaps some of you would like to write uh, in prose, you can create it as a simple essay or a paragraph or a letter. And in terms of that, it's interesting that Carolyn Forche's uh, play, a poem, maybe some would call it a prose poem, I don't know. But the point is that it, the form is a type of paragraph. Yeah. yeah it's a paragraph. And mm -hmm. so I find that interesting. And I think there's a more of that going on now that poets feel freer to write in in different ways so mm -hmm. whatever your metier is whether it's prose a letter a poem uh you know just just go for it so are there any questions or comments that you would like to make before we, we try to write something any questions are you saving yourselves for catharsis Let's see. <laughs> Hi, Carol. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, Jackie, who's sort of like in charge, do you think if we wrote for 20 minutes, that would be appropriate? Yes. I mean, it depends how everyone else feels. I, 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 it's fine for me. Is that okay for you? Mm -hmm. is, is everybody okay with that? 20 minutes? Yeah. So then, yeah. All right. Okay. So, it is now, according to my watch, uh, 11.17, go for it. Okay. Oh, sorry, Carol, I joined in late. Uh, what will we be writing? Well, we're writing a, a poem since this is called the Poetry of Witness or a Prose, whatever people want. 
and uh, it can be a political poem, it can be a family member poem, but it will be a poetry, a poem of witness. And I know you write those, Francesca. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've been writing for approximately 20 minutes. So I think perhaps it's time to, to read. And I hope that everyone will have the opportunity to, to do so. I was trying to look at the participants, but it's not coming up. How many are we, Jackie? I have 14. 14, okay. Well, it's, it's, it's difficult, but perhaps we should just go, go by volunteering, because uh, would someone want to go first? Just raise your hand, don't be shy. Okay, Karen. Someone else will make that down too. Oh, oh, do you want someone else to go? Or? Oh, well, there's a person above you on my screen with Susanna, a hand Susanna. Okay, what's well, Susanna? Okay, Susanna, want... do you want, Susanna, do you want to read and then Karen? I'll go after Karen. Okay. Okay, hi, hi, Susanna. Okay, um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay, this is called, um, for now, my father's suitcase. Like a worn deck of cards, we shuffle ourselves. One, two, three. Which of my children is coming with me? My father asks angrily. Not for the first time. My father asks, I'm gonna take that out. Asks, not for the first time or the last. Like a worn deck of cards, we shuffle ourselves. One, two, three. Three. He pulls an old suitcase from a closet. His big hands, one missing a finger from the Great War, closes around, closes around its close around its handle. He tugs it to the floor. Was he really leaving this time? Was he really leaving? What should we do? We three worn, trembling little cards. We three worn little kids. I'm the favorite, I thought, the one who writes words my father loves and longs to write himself. It should be me. It must be me. The sacrificial lamb in me replies, let my, father, let my brother nurse his hate untouched. Let my sister be safe. I will go. I will go. I step forward. My father's anger spent. He heaves the suitcase back upon the shelf. You are safe. You are safe. Safe, you are safe. My heart sings. Until tomorrow, my head replies. Wow, that's wonderful. I love your title, it's just perfect. <laughs> I mean, it sets, it sets the whole thing up, it's just great. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Susanna. And Susanna? If we, have, if we have time left, we can comment on people's poems, but I would like everyone to get a chance if we can. Well, maybe the next, person, the next person to read can make a brief comment about the previous person. Karen, I really love your use of the cards and very, very poignant scenario. Mm. Uh, very universal. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Susan. You're welcome, Karen. Um, interview of my father. My husband trains the camcorder on you and steadies the lens. I'm off to the side, out of the picture, of course. You sit at the card table, uh, oak, carved oak table I rescued from a curb, hauled to graduate school, now the surface where we eat. You have pulled your chair in so the edge presses into your belly as if the pocked expanse of wood were a part of your body. You look like the Zoltan gypsy telling fortunes for a quarter in his lit boardwalk box, all top and no bottom. You stare into the lens and begin. This is the record of my life for generations to come when I am no longer here. I ask, what was your position in the Budapest Ministry of Defense? You wave me off with the back of your hand I'm too off to the side for it to be a slap. 
you tell the camera that your family, you always refer to it as my family, reaches back to St. Stephen. And here's the family Bible and the coat of arms. And then you spread out the family tree, a blanket of paper, a yard square, point out that Miklos, your name, has a lineage that goes back through families of, through a family of nobles. When you are done with the mat, with the tree, you motion for me to take it, tell me to fold it back up like a map so you can, so you can take it. Behind you is the fireplace. You won't let me light when you're here. The Domyan woodcut entitled Phoenix that you asked us to keep for you because the hollow eyes and sharp beak scare you. I feel I have your whole genealogy. <laughs> okay, I mean, if anyone's gonna make a comment, just make it brief so we can get everyone in. Okay, I, I love the, the blanket of uh, blanket of paper and the Sultan in the on the boardwalk. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that was, was that was great. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll read Casper to read next. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hello? Catherine, wait. Yes. Catherine? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Oh, great. Hang on. Sort of. I didn't write anything, but I have my printer going, but I'm listening. Okay. Oh, good morning. I heard of the passing of. Um, Valerie Boyd, the niece of the writer Zora Neale Hurston. So this poem is a piece of a Zora Neale Hurston poem that I found in archives. It's a very short, it's called More Passions. It says, winter bleak, melancholy days, still remember joy, love to wait. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I just want to say thank you very much that Nora Zeal Hurston is one of oh, my, beautiful. my favorite writers. And I thank you for that. I would never have heard it otherwise. Thank you. Okay. Virginia? Uh, I didn't have my hand up. <laughs> oh, I was going by an hour. Well, you know, yes or no. I, but there were people who had their hands up. And we're waiting, so I'll wait until they read. Okay. And who would that be, pray tell? There's somebody up there waving. Eleanor. Eleanor. Oh, Eleanor. Hi, Eleanor. Now I see you waving. Go ahead. <laughs> when when you said put your hand up, I did both the old school and the yeah the, the symbol. I'm, you know. I'm old school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the name that I refer to may be hard to catch. It's W. Kamau Bell. Uh, the comic and writer. Thank you, W. Kamau Bell, for talking about Cosby, who took and took and took, even as he talked and talked and talked his oh-so-good game. This poem is to you. It is all your words. Thank you for saying. It's hard to believe that some things are true until it happens to someone you know. And thank you for saying. We are trained to not believe women. If a woman says that, she will not be believed. So we needed you to say that. And thank you for telling us what Cosby said in his magically sealed dis deposition that, oh, it was in the area between permission and rejection. And that I am not stopped. Of course, people who are drugged cannot stop you. You made sure with the drugs you freely admitted you were in the habit of putting in their drinks. Thank you, W. Kamau Bell, for talking about the lines of what is legal and what is just and how they do not always rhyme. Very timely, that's for sure. I'm just waiting now in case anyone wants to say anything. <laughs> All right, and so is there a hand? Actually mine. 
actually mine. Um, anyone else? I, I don't know. Okay, have, go ahead. Have... Go ahead, Lisa. Okay. I'm sorry. I was just reliving the crap that, that I wrote. So, I mean, not the crap, the experience. So it's a little too long. WTF. Elated, I woke in my son's twin bed and tasted the warmth of a dream that promised our son Chris would go to college and shock his peers. Professors, as if creating paintings or sculpture, unusually charged. And with the sunlight filling my chest, I tiptoed down carpeted stairs, trying not to awaken my daughter and friend till asleep, still asleep in my queen size bed without their, their eyeglasses without the eyeglasses I had removed to the buzz of the DDD, DVD repeating, repeating. My ex-husband tried to break into a phone call with my boyfriend, my new lover, twice, then a third time, as I said, my gotta go, something important is happening. There was Tony's voice. I felt the shocking chill strike my core like a thunderbolt. I'm in the ambulance with Chris and he's overdosed. They're working on him, wait. Frantically, Tony yelled at the EMTs with a, with a voice of tears, terror. Is he alive? Is he alive? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. He was at a party. I don't remember what he said after these words. I turned to stone, fossilized me in monotone, in my own death knell, as if in cardiac arrest. I don't understand the dream. It promised it would be all right. Is this real? We must have ended the call. I called my mother. We may have a funeral to go to, I said, at ground zero, flattened under the crushing, rolling weight of, a, of life's steamroller. Chris overdosed. He overdosed. I don't know. I don't know what she said as a coroner. What did he take? I must find out. What did he take? Go to the house where he told me that his friend's mom was home. Tired after work, I just stayed in the car and said, okay, a sleepover time to hang out with a friend, with friends. Okay. Good Christmas celebration passed. I seemed happier at school, not intensely depressed anymore, able to go to school, had a new girlfriend. Okay, okay, okay. It will be okay, the dream said. Rosie and Aubrey needed milk, needed milk for breakfast. I, I need to stop by that house, that house. The police car still parked in front. His friend Carlito still speaking with a young officer. Carlito's stepdad watching Carlito speak. The officer said he was the has the name of the drug and what happened, what happened? Carlito found him bashing his head into the tub, convulsing on the floor in the bathroom. Not yet dawn, smashing, smashing himself. I saw Chris in the PICU ward after transport to a regional medical center on a ventilator and unconscious. But the dream, the dream said, Rosie skipped unnaturally as I picked her up from teenage row, Aubrey's home, Aubrey's father's home a ponytail swaying as if still innocent, Aubrey's eyes drawn with compassion. Or drawn, to oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank you, Lisa. Sure. I was struck with the immediacy of that poem and the, uh, the details that really was very powerful. I'm always surprised how some write so much to prompts. It's, it just ne never ceases to amaze me. I'm, a, I'm very succinct. I can't do that. <laughs> it's wonderful. I don't think I can do it either. I'll read what I wrote, but what I wrote is more like trying to get an outline of something. Uh, I feel some of you did, some of the last people did finish poems. It was amazing. Um, so I'm just gonna try to read this. And I, I guess if I ha uh, have to give it a title, it's unable to paint. A second eight year sentence, how can one endure? All Juna wanted was to hold a banner, freedom of the press, freedom of speech. Juna, broadcasting student, did not know then her destiny. Her protest brought her to detention, then prison. Her husband, a musician, died in prison. Her mother died from the strain of worry. Poet, painter, unable to paint since 1999, Juna was put to making shoes, sweaters, and scars for foreign export, uh, uh, packaging, disposable chopsticks, and cotton swabs, night work, underground, kept from fellow companionship, all 
for her love of freedom. In 2008, Juna's husband, a musician, was and she were detained because a Falun Gong book was in their car. Yu Zhu, that's her husband's name, her husband died in prison of, of natural causes, but Juna does not believe this story. Uh, she writes, she was in, um, she wishes she were in Auschwitz where she could die quickly. Beijing prison living is worse than death. Still a poet, she wrote, quote, I felt dignity with my hair covered with other people's sticky, thick saliva. I felt cleanliness, happiness, because there is no power to rise. There is a power rising from inside me. All that I have that no one can take from me, that is faith, such faith in human freedom gives all others hope in their suffering. But how can we participate in ending such suffering? The Olympics are situated a short distance from some prison camps. What does the world know? What does it buy? Mm, wow, very strong, Virginia. Well, I'm really trying to get the details from her life and all this is coming yes. out. You know, she's, she's a real prisoner of conscience and freedom. Yeah. And going wonderful. through absolute hell. Mm -hmm. One of the things they do to these prisoners is put them like in a, in a split and then jump on their legs. Oh so my they really cripple these, these prisoners. My goodness. Hoping yeah. they, you know, give in or give up, but they right. usually don't, you know. Right. Okay, like well, that was, that was definitely a poem of witness, that's for sure. All right, so Jackie, you look like you really want to read what you have there. No, I don't. Well, I'm, I'm stunned <laughs> by what's, what people are reading. Um, and as you know, the only time I write poetry is in the workshop. So, um, not just, um, and this is benign compared to everyone else's. It's just a kind of scribble, but um, I will I will read what I have so far. It's not finished. It's not really started properly, but I called it my Bronx because I grew up in the Bronx. We were always told to say the Bronx. But anyway, my Bronx, the grass around the rock in the park down the hill gave off grit, a city smell, a trampled oasis, an ac acrid with boot bottoms, dog feces, pigeon droppings, the occasional shard of glass. We were children there, sliding down the rock to soften our jeans, climbing back up, sliding down again. Lovely, ripped pockets. We were girls there uh, on that hill of grass and granite. We could see the rounded roof of the number two bus to Broadway. We were women there, passing by on the way to the L train. From the windows, we saw other parks of grass and granite and broken glass where other children played. But that's all I got so far. That, that's great. That's, yeah, that's a wonderful story, yeah. Jackie. Yeah. Yeah. You should have more faith in yourself. You're always, yeah. you know, you always got this preamble. That, that was yeah. really terrific. Yeah. The preamble is true. <laughs> Well, thank you. You know, it's it's all in the details. The details are just wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thanks. should I should I call on somebody or because I'm I'm staring at Francesca. She looks like she really <laughs> wants to she really wants to read. Um, so I can go next if there's no one else. <laughs> Please. Um, so I'm talking about the genocide that happened in 2008 and um, the world was silent uh, because everyone had blood on their hands, um, including the US and India. Um, so this is about uh, the what happened um, within that genocide. Um, the sea becomes land under the blood moon. You said you would wait for me at the bend of the horizon where once the sky was pink and orange. 
the drones come first and then the bombs and my people fall one by one, bodies drawing warmth in death. Yet fire would know that the life is gone from them into this land, into its sea. I see you just before I fall. Bastards, you shout as if saying hallelujah. Your arms propping me up, your cyanide capsule heavy against your throat. Do you have one for me, I ask, my hand against his cyanide. My lost people, tangled bodies on a blood-soaked beach. What poetry could there be after this darkest night? Mm. 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 Powerful. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh, say that, that that was beautiful, Francesca. It's Karen. Uh, one line Thank that you. I especially liked was the one the orange what was it the orange pink uh, in the beginning because uh, the moon. yeah it was like a vision of what the world could be and then we see what it's sort of become you know in the rest of the poem which i think is very powerful yeah and the repetition of blood in the poem mm. Mm. And, and again a, a pure poem of witness wonderful yeah and the land became the she. Yeah. Um, also, I was going on Adorno. I think it was Adorno who said that there is no poetry after Auschwitz. Uh, yes, yes. That, I forget who you. I forget who that was. Somebody, but then they said there were a lot of criticisms of his remark. Let me put it that way. <gasps> Oh, yes, boy. there was the need to bear witness. Yes. So, yes. exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I just have people on the screen here. Is there anyone who has not read? Ron. We've all read. It's the no, gentleman Ron. there who raised his Ron hand. Ron Bremner, my husband. No, oh, Ron. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know whether this could be personal or whether it has to be uh, something in the outer world. Mine is very personal, and uh, I don't know if that's okay. It's definitely yeah. okay. Yeah. All right. I might, okay. I will never forget his eyes that the last time I saw him. His eyes had always been a light blue and were the first thing most people noticed about him. But now the irises were a darker shade of blue and they filled his eyes. There were no pupils. He was lying in his hospital bed. It was where he had spent the last weeks. He had been shaking badly with his Parkinson's and a hospital neurologist, not his regular, had suggested taking him off Ildopa to see what happens. He never spoke again after that was done. Mom paid a young girl to shave him. I don't know if he knew he was being shaved. When I spoke to him, his eyes turned toward me. They saw me, except for that last time. Mm -hmm. That last time, the eyes looked straight ahead. I looked into them. I don't know what those shadows saw, but I like to pretend they saw me. I knew it was ended. I left. The next day, we got the word. That's it. Very good, very good. So that's definitely a poem of witness. That's what I was saying at the beginning. I don't know if you're here, Ron, that, you know, they can be personal. Mm -hmm. We've all written those, we've all written those. Okay, well, if it's all right with everybody, I'd like to read my poem. Carol, <laughs> did you not go? I, um, Catherine, someone named Catherine is raising her hand. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, I just had a little thing I wrote. I didn't know what the assignment was. I got in late uh, for the workshop, but I just wrote something I witnessed. 
Sitting in the Barnes Noble Cafe, I saw the truth. He looked at his dad. He was mad. With each criticism, that downward angle of that beginning smile increased. The brute, unaware of the impact on his son's soul. Our, our eyes met. The child knew. I knew his heart. He must have felt my memory. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've seen, I, not necessarily me, but I've seen so many times parents criticize their children. Yeah. And they I have know. no idea. Sure. They have, being a teacher, I have no, you have no idea how many times I saw that. And it's hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I know. Yeah. It's so horrible when that happens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that line. He knew my heart. And my memory, beautiful, the end. Thank beautiful. you. Okay. Very strong. So you ready for me? Yes. Yes. Valentine. The sun invites itself into my study. I leaf through my calendar. It is February 14th, Valentine's Day. My love is without arms, feet, toes. He left his shoes on the closet rack. I gave them away. Between black and shadow, sun and light, the world is breaking apart. Breakfast, cup of coffee from chipped English china. It's early, squirrels chase each other. Everything loses its body. The wounded sun comes through the window. Somewhere, you are not speaking, seeing, hearing. I think of the lovers, hands held tight. Mm. Mm. So, uh, any thoughts or comments on how it felt to be writing these poems? Did you feel as if you were writing a poem, you know, this poem of witness? That's the topic of the the, uh, workshop. Well, thank you, Carol. I was grateful because I often hear a news story, <clears throat> excuse me, and jot down some notes, always get back to it. And since I heard this interview yesterday, this was great timing. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> I haven't, I have, it's, it's still like a, a trauma to actually have penned that poem. It's mm-hmm. like the first time I could write about it. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's but you wrote great. very well about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, you know, I find free writing is very freeing. And I'm, <laughs> I'm constantly amazed by what comes out of you. And I cannot figure what the process is, is because yeah. uh, we can walk around and not write anything. And suddenly that free writing makes something happen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I was just going to say that this, uh, my father's suitcase poem is a poem that I started. You know, I had the image of the three decks of cards somewhere it's on a piece of paper somewhere but in this free write i was able, yeah, somehow i was yeah. able to uh you know move through it um so i'm grateful you know it carried yeah. me farther yes yeah. yeah that's great and as i said before suitcase is such a wonderful image because yeah. it conjures up so many things i mean this is a personal poem but i really was thinking of the suitcases and going off to auschwitz or wherever yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know i mean you you just led me in my subjective response to many places mm-hmm. yeah karen i wonder if you could i don't mm-hmm. know i didn't get to hear the poem because i was still stuck <laughs> where I was and like I wonder if you'd mind sharing sharing the poem or um, um I would be glad to do that but I don't want to take uh, only if you know it's okay with Carol I would read it I mean it's not that long I'd read it again but uh, Carol should decide because you know I, I don't want to take up time from the workshop so um, I, de- oh. I defer. I defer to Jackie. She's she's my boss. Sure, <laughs> sure. Maybe in the interest of time, you could exchange emails. Could you email it to Lisa? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Sure, well, I, I could do that, uh, Lisa, if you... Um, I could uh, Mm -hmm. I'll give you my email right now, and then okay. you know should you should you want to. If you change your mind, it's okay. But no, no, it would. I would love to write it up. It's just handwritten. That would be good for oh, us. Oh. So, yeah, so let me. Uh, I, I just want to write it down. L. Brookman. Oops, I just had it. I just saw it. Yeah, it's down there on the screen. Yeah, it was. Oh. It okay, so yeah. While that, yeah. While that's L. Brookman, happening. You put oh, it in chat, right. I guess. Oh, oh, it's in chat. Okay, let me see. Um, in I just chat. saw it there. Oh, I see oh. it. Okay, I see chat. Okay. Uh, oh, I see it. Wonderful. L. Brookman, 28 at Gmail. Okay, um, I will definitely send it to you, um, Lisa. Thank okay, you. Okay, so, so um, before we go, one more question for either for you all to think about or, or discuss. We could have a little time to discuss it. Where do you think the poem you wrote today and being here, because we don't want to write just one poem, might take you or lead you? Like, you know, what, what you wrote, will it, can it lead you elsewhere? Mm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The answer is yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, what I discovered well, was I can't read my own handwriting. That's always been a problem yes, lately. Yeah. I don't know. I write mm -hmm. things very rapidly, and then I look back. What on earth did I write? And I'm struggling to type it up. It's better if I write on the typer, you know, on the type. You know what I mean? On yes, the computer. Yes. But mm -hmm. you're not always near a computer, and so right, a piece right, of paper, right. mm -hmm. you know, stopping mm -hmm. at a stoplight, writing. Virginia, yeah. Virginia yeah. are you are you on your are you on your computer now, Virginia? Yes, but I didn't write this on the computer. I wrote oh, I it on a you scratch know you pad. Can't. You can, you can, you can uh, exit the full screen and still be in the meeting, and you can type things up on your computer. Just so oh, you know, no. the next time. Oh. I never thought of that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Let me You're just. Very technical. I'm not. So. Well, <laughs> if you go up to your upper right hand corner and you see view. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you hit the exit full screen. And then you can come back in after you're done oh, writing. Thank you. I, I did not I know that. My poem. Oh, I read you. my poem off the screen. I read oh. it off the screen. So wow. I, I just want, I don't want to leave without saying to Lisa that I was, I was stunned. I couldn't think after your poem. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was really in a bad way after your poem. And of all yeah. the- It was a work, marvelous poem. Work read here, that one will stick with me through the day. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So please don't, you know. It was the tightest poem, I think, and your imagery was so perfect. Yeah, and it was so immediate. It was so, you were right yes. there. It was like a heartbeat. You were hearing a heartbeat and you were, you know. It was oh, our first penning. It was our first mm. penning. It was just mm. a horrible experience. I almost want to say, I'm, a, I'm sorry I shared it because it's like, as a parent, I think it's like mm. so many people, even as, you know, a family member or a loving friend, like you just yeah. are struck, like you're fossilized suddenly. Boop. Yeah, that was a great line, by the way. Mm -hmm. Well, petrified, I think, is over you. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll just say, in terms of continuing, uh, Carol, that, um, that I have sort of a, I have a, you know, the beginnings of a kind of memoir, something that I have put together. Um, it's called Hiding at Home, actually. <laughs> and uh, in it, you know, one of the ways I've thought of format is to include, because I love poetry, to include a series of poems. Like I have a poem about my brother, you know, that, who's mentioned in this poem. And and so this was helpful, you know, because I, I took this one image and at least I began to develop it. You know, I'm sure I'll do some more work on it, but this, this was helpful because it's making me think this could be a powerful way to intersperse poetry with narrative, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's know. good because it led you not only to write a poem, but to think about form. Yes. And you're, yes. Because I'm, yeah, I think mixing forms again, yeah, uh, yeah. like writing, poems and paragraphs or whatever you want to call them has mm -hmm. become much more 
acceptable, fashionable, whatever words. Sure, you sure, sure, sure. I'm, I'm writing a children's fantasy, and there are lots of poems in it interspersed with the narrative. I really like that sort of way of, you know, kind of uh, conveying things to a reader. So, or whatever. But thank you. So that was helpful. Well, well as you know, um, I have been working on my Holocaust manuscript. I've mm. had many poems from the points of view of um, uh, liberators, victims, survivors, mm -hmm. uh, some, some, you know, voices mm -hmm. from the dead. And, uh, and, and, and this, uh, I'm really glad that you, uh, thank you for this workshop, by the way, all of you. Yes, um, really. Carol, uh, yeah. Jackie, um, you yeah. know, South Wonderful. Um, because I do have these, these interviews on videotape and I have been really oh. not wanting to look at mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. uh, because he may have had some complicity in the deportations of the Jews uh, from Hungary, and I, I'm I'm pretty sure he did, and uh, and so I this is the first poem I've written directly about mm -hmm. the interviews, and I want to thank you for this forum, all of you. You know, uh, when we have each other that we know we're going to be listened to, um, it makes a big yeah. difference. So I'm going to yeah. have a series of poems about those interviews, and so wow. so. That's uh, gonna help my manuscript and I thank you. Susan, I feel your welcome. weight. I feel your, sorry, I, I feel you, the weight when you ran in your poem through all this self-righteous, I mm -hmm. am an aristocrat. And this is what I did, you know, like that intense rage. That was your father? Yes. Thank you, Lisa. Oh. Really appreciate yeah. that comment. Yeah. Oh, my that, oh my God. Oh my God. I hated him. Click your heels. Flip your heels, you know, and you know I'm 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 out of the screen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't want to take more time, but thank you. Yeah, oh, and I okay. love the. I just love the way Susanna that you were off the screen far enough so he couldn't slap you. <laughs> that's, it. <laughs> yeah. that's it at all, you know. You yeah. did it right there. That's the whole poem in itself, you know, that one line. I yeah. just want to say that listening to all of you, you. Uh, you reinforced something I think about quite often is that um, everyday people, you know, walking around are the real heroes because mm -hmm. we don't know of one another, you know, what we've mm -hmm. witnessed and mm -hmm. what we've seen. And to paraphrase from Elie Wiesel, um, many of us have, have witnessed unspeakable things. And mm -hmm. so we don't often talk about them. And right. Carol somehow is so at ease with, written language mm -hmm. that I think she helps us relax. Yeah. Like, and yeah. that's one explanation I have for um, just enjoying being in her company. She, she uh, Carol, you, you make me feel like it's okay. And <laughs> I surprised myself. Um, mm -hmm. That I, was a wonderful poem, Jackie. Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I surprised myself because I am very much um, thinking about the Holocaust lately because I lost my both my parents rather recently and um, they both were they both came to the United States in 1948 and survived the war in Europe but it, it's they have complicated stories each one and so my house is full of Holocaust books and Holocaust mm -hmm. books. Mm. Uh, BR was probably one of the first poems I ever read as a very very young person and I and and I thought, oh, for sure, poetry of witness, whatever's going to come out of me is going to be about the Holocaust. But it wasn't. It was about my childhood. And so mm -hmm. I was surprised by that. That's mm -hmm. great. That's great. Well, I have a Hallmark assignment before we uh -oh. go. Mm -hmm. Carol. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, it's the <laughs> academic in me. I can't help myself. But in any case, um, uh, you know, I read several poems to you today, which, as I said, are like key poems. I mean, particularly Paul Salam's poems. And I know all of you are probably reading poetry all of the time, <laughs> but maybe you just want to search out a few poems like that that speak to you. Now, before I write, I always have a book of poetry beside me. Mm -hmm. lately, it's, lately, it's been Pablo Neruda. He's been accompanying me for some months now. I, I guess I have to move on. But I find it very helpful mm -hmm. to 
before I start to write, to read some poems and mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it kind of just gets me into that consciousness, if you will, or so I'm just throwing it out to you as a possibility before when you sit down to write. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, and, and you guys wonderful to yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do that. Uh, I enjoyed everybody's poems, and I was especially grateful that you read the Carolyn Forche poem because many years ago, when I was first reading poems and trying to write poems, I was stunned by that poem, and of course, I'm stunned every time by that poem. And it's a good reminder of the details the de the just the concrete mm -hmm. of our lives yeah. thank you yeah. could you give the title of that i came a couple of minutes late colonel so, the, the, yeah. colonel, the colonel the colonel okay yeah. thank you you know it's interesting one of the things that i have found lately because this is for Shay's Bo's first book and i just ordered louise luke's last book but i love her first book isn't it so interesting that what comes out of people first their first book seems so sensitive and and so touching i mean that's just what i've been finding yeah. lately maybe yeah I'm, maybe I'm wrong. i don't know can yeah. i say some of it is for people especially those of us who don't get a book published till we're older that first mm -hmm. book is so many years of making <laughs> yeah yes yeah. i think you know, that's, that's uh, carol that's i think you yeah. didn't give the name of the writer of the um, the morning, it's I think it's Robert Hayden, isn't it? Yes. Oh yeah, yes. Robert, yeah. Robert Hayden. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Think uh, you yeah. mentioned him. Yeah. I just have to tell you a quick story about that poem, those winter Sundays. That is so amazing. Um, I was in a little poetry group with the Wright group, and we would um, basically oh. we come in and we bring, you know, poems of other people, not our poems. <laughs> and I saw that poem, those winter Sundays on one of those poetry in motion, uh, you know, posters in the subway. And it was so <laughs> amazing. I was almost getting off, but I copied down the first lines and I put it on a little shred of paper and I had to bring a poem to this poetry workshop. So somehow that little shred of paper surfaced and I found the poem, so I brought it. And that same day, someone else brought the same Poem, those winter Sundays and we had not discussed it with each other and it just sort of amazed me you know it was just and it's such a beautiful Sunday yes yes yeah beautiful poem I mean those winter offices you know those austere how yeah. can I know how can I know the repetition of that last line is just so beautiful but also, as a for me, as I said before yeah the angers of this house whoa that's a right me. I took it yeah. right down to, to my house. I was in my house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Believe me, I was there with the suitcase, you know. And so, yeah. Yep. Okay, well, I thank you all very oh, much for attending. Thank you. And hopefully, thank you. Jackie will be presenting me with a, another workshop in the next few months. Yes. Oh, great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you much, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Jackie.